Hold on, hold on. So introduce yourselves because this mm-hmm. is our Veterans Day podcast. Yep. Mm-hmm. We have uh, a couple of faces that have been on the podcast before and, and a new one that we're introducing, but kind of outnumbered right here. I mean, it takes three Army people to make one fully Navy brain it's average true. of well, strength. It, it, yeah, it's, it's true. just because you're a submariner. Yeah. <laughs> I think what it is, is it right. takes three of us to butch you up enough <laughs> that we can do this. You know what I mean? I actually feel tougher just sitting amongst <laughs> you guys. I feel like I'm going to have like, I'll probably start growing facial hair soon. So <laughs> we just I'm, won't be able to see it. <laughs> Well, you're mean, so you're going last. Uh, you so, have a nice, uh, shiny, bald head, knows by the me. way. Uh, uh, Chicago Joe. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, like I said outside, there's only, uh, I mean, talking to Joseph Pinzon is one of my favorite things to do. But mm-hmm. when Joseph Pinzon has had a drink or two, it's my favorite time in the world to ever talk to Joe Pinzon because he's Chicago Joe. All right, yeah. introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Vance McMurray, uh, army guy, West Point guy, uh, 712 jump guy. That's it. Um, yeah. Among other things. Okay. So my name is, uh, Jesse Sargent, AKA El Jefe, AKA Jeffy, uh, (laughs) former, former, former army infantry. All right. So we got three army, one Navy guy. And the objective of this one was, there's gonna be veterans that, uh, we touched a lot of veterans, right, from the industry, but there's active duty people we're trying to touch. And the podcast lets us get back mm-hmm. into the bases a little bit more. So <clears throat> I don't, I mean, Fort Hood is, is that the largest army base? Hood? Is the mm, Hood the biggest? I think largest by land mass. Yeah, it's Bragg is, Bragg has like the most Population, people. yeah. Or whatever. What's the headquarters of Bragg? Uh, is that what? Airborne Corps. So that's all your airborne dudes? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, predominantly, right, 82nd's a big yeah, division, but then you've yeah. got like three, two, Two special forces group, all the you know special warfare center schooling stuff. Is and that then, the HQ for your guys' SF teams? And for stuff? Green Berets, it is. Yeah. Is it really? Yeah. Do you know anything about those Green Berets? No. <laughs> uh-uh. It's like I, I may have, may not have made out with one when I was in active duty, <laughs> which is okay. I just assume that that's what happens. I'm not we judging. call we call uh, Vance Rambo. No, no, it's uh, no, his name is Jason Cooler. Born. No, 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 no. It's uh it's, it's Roadhouse. <laughs> oh it's, uh Patrick Swayze's mentor. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that was him. Hey, I heard that the first time Dalton. today. <laughs> well Dalton was Patrick Dalton, Swayze. Yeah. Now we're well, who's close. Dalton's boss? Dalton Kincaid, right? Wasn't that his name? Or? Was it oh. wait Dalton? Now you're just showing up. I got a yeah. just show. Was his name yeah. Kincaid? No, the cooler, like the guy that was yeah, tougher. Exactly. Um yeah. All right, listen, I loved his work in uh, Star is Born as well with Lady Gaga. Yes. I think that you rocked that one. Yes, he was the brother. That was Bradley Cooper's brother. Yeah, you killed it in that one. It wasn't Dirty Dancing. (laughs) You weren't in that one. (laughs) Who would have been the Patrick Swayze? Would you have been the Patrick Swayze for our team if that's the cooler? If if he had hair. Yes, if I had hair. And- would I you do, put I do in dance, a I do dance really well. I'm really I mean, like, I'm a, listen, Have you ever seen yeah. his ribbon dancing? I workshop. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> he's a three times state champion from Illinois. Go to <laughs> josephpinson.com and you'll see my work. It's true. He dabs true. in the silks. I mean, I still workshop a lot of moves. Yeah. That, you know. You just choreograph now? Well, I, listen, I'm not trying to be it's all about me and showy. I really am keeping it. <laughs> <laughs> the artist, hey. artistic form inside. So listen, let's start with uh, the reason why I want to touch the bases is because I want these soldiers, sailors, and airmen to understand that outside of the homogenous industries that exist that we're all, you know, most aware of, they're the most prevalent, you know, automotive, manufacturing, retail, healthcare, mm-hmm. um, technology, banking, financial whatever uh there's this really really cool industry that is emerging it's in its infancy still and uh every other industry tends to depend on this industry for yeah, its right growth now. right so i've had uh i had the privilege of of getting you um when you didn't know what a data center was i'm not saying that you technically do now but you were even less Perfect. proficient back let me then, draw right? your picture yeah preferably <laughs> and then <laughs> with crowns and, and then we've had you for a year now right? yes one, well yeah coming up on a year and then uh, it's been a great year, by the way. Yeah, so awesome. so that's what I want to unpackage. And then Vance, uh, it's ironic how I ran into you, right? So yeah. <laughs> I I'm not sure if it's ironic enough. I'm, I'm you could have been a plant for all I know, right? But what uh, <laughs> we still look at him like this. <laughs> I'm looking at him like he's a dodgy dude still, right? <laughs> Who knows what he did? But I um I remember it was actually Dakota. He gave us those workbenches for the compound. Yeah, but you got to have some weights to go with him. And he's like, Hey, uh, fringe sports is hosting a sale. Go in there. I bumped into you and yeah. you had a task force dagger hat on. And yep. most people don't know what that is. 
So we started talking. I had Caden with me, and he was just getting ready to ship off to the Citadel. You being a West Point guy, uh, you were class of ninety two. I have a 92. brother. Ninety two. Yeah, I have a brother that's class Damn. of ninety six. 92 what were you 10 i was four <laughs> <laughs> four Jesus. yeah so uh yeah we're, we're around really four all kinds of people were you really four <laughs> in 92 <laughs> yeah well, look i have to ask you twice because you went to public school in ohio who knows if you know your math right that's subtracting four years I from something you're not really good at that dude i had like 100 jumps by the time you're like eight <laughs> Oh the shit. <laughs> Were you guys ever active duty at the same time? Oh, I don't. When, when did you uh, retire? When did you get out? I got out in 01. Active oh. duty in 01. <laughs> Bro, I, <laughs> you I was in, high in school. fucking like <laughs> seventh grade. Yeah, but you were there for the third straight year. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's different. That was so, first grade. So here's, <laughs> what, it, it, here's what's true, true though. What? So <clears throat> he is a tough guy, right? right? But- his basic training was no nothing in comparison to a 1990s basic yeah, training. Right Just like it was no comparison to a 1970s basic training uh, where erroneous. they actually physically can hit you. <laughs> Dude, erroneous. I, I, I erroneous. Know these guys. I don't know what I'm talking about. They're onto something. They're saying that they made weaker men when you were going well, through. Well, they, yeah. they And look, they I'm got, not going to argue with these guys. They, they, they got enough complaints uh, in the comment boxes at the end of basic training and say, <laughs> how was your experience? <laughs> Who this has? guy hurt me with his hands. <laughs> and they got enough of that where they said, you know, now it's ridiculous, right? They give out yellow cards. It's a whole thing. Do they on. really? Whoa, 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 whoa. Clear. I <laughs> didn't have any card? of that. No. They were pink? <laughs> no. What color was it? The very first day. All right. So first off, <laughs> when you get there, you go to like 30th AG. This is for infantry. I mean, I don't know what you know, everyone who was a support role did. But <laughs> <laughs> when you're in the infantry, you go to a place called 30th AG and you get there and you're like, bro, this is the army. This is, this is basic training. <laughs> this is great. Like, I can make this work. You know what I mean? And then you go downhill or uh, what do they call it? And it, uh, you go down range or whatever they call it. I can't remember. <clears throat> and you go to your actual basic training. The first night, is horrible and yeah. so like you want to talk about stress cards and shit i didn't have any of that <laughs> the first night they were, we were there i was so fat and had done so many push-ups that like a lake of sweat <laughs> had formed under me and i slipped and i fell to my chest <laughs> and brother Girl, sergeant must have loved hey, that. Why you quit? <laughs> listen this dude comes over and like i don't know if you've ever like played a very competitive game of kickball you know what i mean but like like you run, like if you want to kick home run, you know, like you're running up and you're just going to blast this motherfucker, right? This dude is mid just like fucking, he's like, if you slip, he, his name was Drill Sergeant Raposo, okay? He was like, private, if you slip again, I'm going to kick you in the face. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I fucked up. <laughs> I was like, why did I do this? Hey, did you say that they wouldn't let you go into the chow hall? Yeah, so... uh when I first basic training diet program, girl. when I first got to <laughs> basic training, um, you know, I had a couple extra LBs. Oh, I yeah. did not see that coming. Yep. And they, uh, <laughs> you had to do 10 pull-ups before you could go into the chow hall. And let's just say I struggled with 10 pull-ups. So for a while I got to eat MREs until I lost enough weight that I could do 10 pull-ups. <laughs> and then I got to eat real food like a normal human. All right. Well, good, man. At least yeah. you passed that milestone. But you you came into this industry because your uncle yeah. was in the game and he worked for us. He was and, Farmer Army as well. And he uh, he had lobbied me for months, actually. And I was trying it down. You know, I, I don't know if I was the president of Nova yet, but we were really trying to move away from hiring family members and uh, just the optics of what that looks like. It was a 90 year old GC. Yeah. Um, and you had a lot of second and third generation family members lived there. And that, uh, that was very common back in those days, but we're in a point now where you were trying, that was more frowned upon. So your brother or your uncle kept hammering me until one day he, uh, he was smart enough to tell me that you were a veteran and uh, you had been in combat. Mm -hmm. and, and as a courtesy, I think all of us veterans pick up, the, mm -hmm. like when, almost like, uh, like if you're in Southern California and you went to USC and you're trying to get a job in Southern California, if someone has the ring on that says mm -hmm. they went to the University of Southern California, they, uh, they're they gonna pick up the phone and give you that courtesy and get you have the interview. And the veterans do this. I mean, there's little circles like that everywhere. For us, I missed a couple. I at least mm -hmm. missed one interview with you, made the second one. 
and then um and then brought you right in and and then we just put the fire hose i mean in fact the best part about this and and i'm going to draw it a little bit because you can't but the who was the first customer that you worked on do you remember vantage who is your biggest customer today vantage okay and who is the guy that you deal with there spencer meyer who was the guy that you dealt with when you first started your industry spencer meyer and how and we're talking about 10 years ago right yeah. so wow. So it's important, and I use this as an example because the same can be said with Anthony, right? Mm -hmm. When I hired Anthony, another combat infantry guy, but like you, he was an officer. Uh, put him on one account, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a hyperscale account. And to this day, it's our second largest client today, probably. Yeah. And um, and it's it was his first customer in the industry as well. So you guys have gone full circle, right? I mean, yep. it's not like you've always done work with them, but- nah. I use those two examples of guys that have been in the industry between eight and 10 years who the first touch they had in this industry today are now the two biggest clients that we have as a business, mm -hmm. right? So the first two clients that you both had yeah. are now uh, the two biggest clients we have today, right? And and there's other people that are filling those ranks that are gonna take over those roles, right? For sure. And, and as we do that, I just wanted to make sure I express that to a guy like yourself who's just getting in the game. And this is not like the same. I mean, the soup's not done cooking mm -hmm. and and it's a very uh, niche industry where people tend to do more business with people they like and they're gonna invest heavily into yeah, right understanding on. each other, which I think gives you an advantage, right? Because um, the way that you've been conditioned and trained and, mm -hmm. and what you're designed to do with your purpose. <clears throat> but I wanted to draw that out first because yeah. you've got to, get into this space. And if you're talking to the army, you guys listening at Fort Hood or Bragg or whatever it is, it'd be like, there is zero limits to what you can do. And- uh, Yeah, I know. Oh God, yeah. And I honestly don't even think, uh, there are some industries where the where you went to school, it matters, it matters a lot, right? This industry doesn't really care about this stuff as much, right? It, it doesn't even, in most cases, give a shit if you even finish college. Yeah, in a lot of ways, it's even in the last few months, what's been interesting to me, because I've seen, I've, seen the market from a whole from different industries, right? Yeah. And most of those businesses, you'll probably agree with this, is like functionally the skill sets required to be successful in a lot of, in most other industries have gotten super specific. And what I see in this space is there's, it's similar, but it's still in its infancy. And right. So you can take somebody, you can teach them the ropes and they can be successful. Yeah. Yes. hundred percent. Well, yeah. you, I think one of the things that gives everybody the advantage or an equal opportunity towards success is the fact that experience doesn't matter industry experience in this industry doesn't matter industry experience in a mature industry where it's code locked down and it's homogenous in the construct that it that it exists in and they're you know have maybe heavily regulated or governed mm -hmm. um, but there's not a lot of changes so everything in that business is designed around optimization yeah. for excellence if there's not a lot of disruptive changes taking place um, then experience matters for everything because it is about, you know, Bruce Lee talks about it, you know, where it's, you know, he doesn't fear the man that has 10,000 kicks. He fears mm -hmm. the man that has made the same kick 10,000 times. And, and Malcolm Gladwell talks about it in his book, you know, uh, uh, Outliers, where it, it's 10,000 hours, but whether it's 10,000 kicks, mm -hmm. 10,000 hours, 10,000 laughs, it takes 10,000 consistent repetitions to be good at anything, yeah. right? So to be great at something, you kind of have to be code locked. Startups are not notorious for being code locked in mm -hmm. the early stages. We're being so disruptive that we're changing so dynamically. So when you get into this industry that's changing so dynamically and so quickly, experience is no longer is it's it it's fleeting it's mm -hmm. like bill gates talked about the life expectancy of a first mover's advantage is it, it lasts as long as a banana and and having experience in this industry from the industry subject matter expertise perspective less important than having experience being pressure tested and exploring your emotional range which oh. is why i've always said veterans do a tremendous job in this industry their transition rate is higher and as much as I always hated to say it, army people tend to do the best as well as combat infantry in the Marine Corps or people that were in high, highly dangerous or highly kinetic roles in the military because they don't measure mission critical on downtime like we do in this industry. Mm -hmm. They measure it on their mortality. How many times did you jump out of a whatever? 712. No, that's 712 times that only needed one time for that parachute not to open type thing, right? Or, oh, it, it didn't. 
<laughs> but a couple times. <laughs> so you're going to share some stories because I yeah. want to have some veteran stories and I want people to connect. I want people that want to be in this industry to understand what draws people to this industry. Mm -hmm. I want people that are in this industry to understand the advantages they have. Your guys' stories will help bring that or amplify that. People know, I mean, I came from a submarine community and I got into critical power. And if you get into yeah. critical power, it's inevitable until you fall into this vertical. I started with hospitals and radio stations and radio towers, manufacturing plants, and then all of a sudden, boom, data centers took off. And next thing you know, I haven't been in a hospital mm -hmm. you know, for work since. I haven't done anything but data centers since. So the thing is, is this industry doesn't, uh, it rewards uh, character, mm -hmm leadership capability and the ability to work hard. Those three things are the only things you need to be successful. Do you agree? hundred percent. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that end understanding, you know, how you got in, we'll come back to yours <clears throat> later, but Vance, we ran into each other and uh, how did I even, I was with my son. Yeah. I think because I know what you did in the army, uh, and knowing that he wants to go into, uh, he's at the Citadel, he mm -hmm. thinks that he wants to go to, I don't know what the path is to get into becoming a Green Beret or a mm -hmm. Delta guy, but uh, I'm pretty sure that he's trying to follow that path, right? And and you came over to the house the next day. I think I had Dakota at the house that day anyway. So you Yeah, yeah, the whole crew there. Yeah, so, yeah. but I mean, like, we just rolled you right into the fold. It was something that when we met, I was like, hey, man, mm -hmm. you should call me. And that's kind of what happens for us is we find outliers and we collect them where we find it them. It could have been because he looks like Wade Garrett. That's, that's his like, name. Who's fucking Wade, Wade Garrett. Garrett? That was uh, Wade Garrett. <coughs> See, I told, you, they I were, told you that was his name. <laughs> <laughs> Wade Garrett was freaking uh, Dalton's mentor. Oh. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> he was sitting here the whole time. He wasn't just waiting. He just heard words, 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 words until he was drilling in on it. Yeah. You think we can edit out that stomach growl? <laughs> Did you, that? Did you get a little, you know, I didn't no rum in the <laughs> Oh, we didn't put anything in the compound out for the team to eat today, did no, we? I mean, did you guys yeah, get the tacos out or something? All right. So, uh, we ran into each other. What is it that brought you in? Because uh, how did you, you knew this industry a little bit because you come from tech. Yeah, I was at, I was in Give your background if you can. Yeah, I was, uh, oh, fuck. So it was a brag as a platoon leader. Hold right? on, so where are you from? Texas. Okay, you were from Texas originally. Where? Corpus. The, the tank so of born Texas. There. Yeah. Right? I was so, there for a couple of years and then bounced between Dallas and Austin growing up. But then you went to West Point. Yeah. And then went, went to West Point, uh, was commissioned in the infantry, went to Bragg, was in the 82nd, um, did all the normal infantry stuff. And then I had a, I don't know what you call him, a neighbor in the apartment complex that I had off Riley Road who this dude was like, I don't know, six, five. And he had this really dope Corvette. And this was like 90, I got there 90, winter of 93. Show up in this dope Corvette at all times, like no name tapes, no patches on his uniform. Sometimes show up in these flight suits and shit. And he and I became friends. And because I'd go out and run on the weekends and he'd come with me sometimes. And there was one day I'd just made first lieutenant. <clears throat> he rolled, I mean, I literally, I walked out my door at six o'clock in the morning. He rolls up in his car and, and parks at 6 a.m. I hadn't seen him in weeks. And I mean, he looked like he'd been on like a, two week trunk. I mean, like he was just wrecked. He's like, Hey, you going running? It's like, yeah, he goes, I'll be right back. Yeah. Shows up in some Ranger panties and running shoes. And I was just going for like six, seven miles. So like maybe an hour or something easy. We run until lunch. Yeah. And he was, he hung over <clears throat> or did he come back? From he a mission? came back from some mission. Yeah. You know, and I never, and I just never asked those kind of questions. Sure. I mean, I was, like I was like 23 and I didn't know. I mean, the internet didn't really exist. It was no cell phones. I didn't know what the fuck was going on. There was only QVC shopping back then. Yeah, it was amazing. It was <laughs> I did it. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, hey, my star major is going to give you a call and see if you want to like work with us. I'm like, okay, cool. I didn't know what the fuck it was. And, and so I show up and he, star major Jones calls me and was like, hey, be at this time, this place tomorrow. And I'm like, okay, I show up. It's just nondescript building, like on, on Camp McCall, which is like this like sub post off of Bragg and sitting around a table with a bunch of old dudes, no uniforms. All of them had long hair. None of them looked like they're in the army and asked a bunch of questions for like four hours. And the next thing I know, like 
they, the Sergeant Major Jones was like, hey, you guys have like this big month long training exercise coming up in three weeks. I was like, yeah. He goes, well, you're not going to go. Like, this is, you're going to come with us to go to selection. I'm like, okay, cool. And so like they, in this world, like they build, re read in, I guess, enough people to enough level of detail that they're like, hey, McMurray's not going to be here. You're going to cover for him. And, and I went and walked my life away for like 47 days. And it was just stupid. Here's a point. Here's a grid coordinate. And I didn't have training. Go. Or and, you know, weird stuff would happen. Like I'd run across people that, you know, it was clearly somehow they were watching me. I'd run across people along the way that would be, hey, I got this math problem. Will you solve this for me? And I'm like, what? <laughs> and it was just like things would get harder and more complex and stuff like that. And the legs would get longer and longer and longer. And I can navigate like a motherfucker. Because I was on the orienteering team at West Point, and that's like competitive land navigation. And I just walked and walked and walked, man. And I, I had the one thing um, that I had that I think got me through this was I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I just knew like I wasn't going to quit. And so like any good first lieutenant at the time, I took a three by five card, wrote on one side, says, if you want to quit, on the bottom right hand corner says, turn it over, turn it over. And then I wrote, take one more step. And then I wrote, turn over on the bottom right corner. And then I laminated it with sticky acetate, right? Uh -huh. Stuck it in my breast pocket of my BDUs. And I had that thing in my hand from like 10 hours into this on day one and just kept it in my left hand, kept my map and compass in the other hand. I just walked. Like I seriously, I don't think I, I mean, I'd sleep in the woods and shit for the next 47 days. That was it. And then wow, that's, that's the crazy, selection process. dude. They just go and they put you out there and see if you'll quit and see how you handle hard things. Wow. Sounds awesome. That's almost exactly like submarine training. Is it? No, <laughs> nothing at all like that. <laughs> so listen, you're in the army. You, uh, you get to do some cool shit. I'm not going to yeah. ask you to talk about any of the shit. Um, you get out and you found your way into technology. Did you get into, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean like. I digressed. Well, I want to know. Yeah, I want to know what you're allowed to talk about and what you feel comfortable talking about. Yeah, so it's that's super, it's it's kind of interesting, right? My last gig was working at the White House, and so I had a company which used to be called SRA, now called CSRA, and so that worked for me. And so I worked in an office called PCP or Presidential Contingency Programs. Um, and uh, the job at the pen at the Pentagon for the DoD Continuity of Operations Program came open that SRA ran. And um, they offered it to me. And, and so I bounced out of my active army role, um, still working in the intelligence community into that job. <clears throat> and so I took over the DOD Continuity of Operations Program in February of 2001, right? Led that through the events of September 11th. Wow. 2001. Have we ever talked about this? No. Oh, really? Yeah, this is amazing. But dude, we could do a whole yeah. podcast on this we'll shit. We'll park that one and then we'll do that on a whole nother podcast. <clears throat> but Yeah, but one of the one of the big problems we found from September 11th was um, failover of email infrastructure. Like literally failing over email infrastructure for the leadership of DOD. Like it was so um, not well planned, right, which I'll own, that I had to win plane or whatever we thought hit the Pentagon, um, that was one sector over from where the Navy leadership data center was. And and so my head of ops, which was this retired Marine Corps E9, he was still at the Pentagon. And uh, I won't go too deep into this, but the only way we could communicate was BBM. Anybody remember what BBM is? Mm -mm. Blackberry. Blackberry Messenger. Yeah. Phones wow. weren't working. I mean, we were sitting there just sitting there on our, our Blackberries just hammering out messages. And he told me like the fire was moving towards the Navy data center. And it's just interesting how the timing of all this should happen because I had just relocated all the leadership of the Navy to where we were. And I knew the fire was headed to the data center. We still hadn't been able to like fail over email to these guys. And so I was like, all right, you and you get on the Blackhawk sitting on the LZ outside. You knew where the servers were in the Navy data center. And you went in there, pulled out these two servers from the racks put them on the Blackhawk, took them back to where we were. We plugged them in, redid all the networking so the Navy could have email infrastructure. And like, that's what honestly started me 
in this whole thing. With data centers and understand how critical they are now? Yeah. Because it, you know, it was probably like 13th or 14th, I don't remember what day, but the comptroller for Department of Defense sat us down like in the middle of the night one night and was like, hey, how much is it going to cost to fix these problems? And I was like, I don't know. So I literally picked up the phone, called EMC, and was like, hey, this is who I am. We have a problem. And you know, fast forward, they hired me away. I had clearances. And so I was like employee number four in EMC Federal at the time. And so I ran all the intelligence community uh, implementations that EMC did. Um, I got a ton of stories from silly stuff back in those days. And and so my experience in data center was like installing storage and running fiber and stuff like that. So not on the construction side, but so that was- when we met and I told you, what did I say that we do? Because I'm I'm always really careful and depending on the audience who I'm, I'm like- Build data centers. We did say that. Yeah. Sometimes I- I would say like, hey, we you know we build the sky for the cloud type of thing because that's easier. If people know what the cloud is, yeah. at least, and that leads to a conversation. But I wondered, uh, I said, we build data centers, and you're like, I know what those are. Yeah. When I told you we build data centers, did you know what they were? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. It's not as prevalent as I thought when I told I you- I no fucking idea. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I don't even know if you still well, do. Well, that right? was 10 years ago. Yeah. We were selling retail um, cloud services. Managed services yeah. and stuff. Yeah. yeah, so. That makes sense. So- uh, did you want to get back in this game? Um, I think, you know, for me, it's, it's a very sentimental job. Like I love building shit. Do we, we'd roll into this classified data center on a, like a Friday night and like midnight with like 10 tractor trailers of EMC storage, like lined up on the loading dock with nothing in there. And by Sunday, like. Pick and move. Yeah. That Sunday it's shit's like humming. Yeah. And it was amazing. Like any who, what dude does not like building stuff and yeah. seeing it like come to life. We've got to build some awesome data centers for some yeah. awesome clients. For sure. Um, all right. So look, I'll park with you then. And because when, by the time that we talked, I want to get back to where you started leaning in and then we were like, let's just find a way to mm -hmm. figure out where the right fit would be. When it was you, we'd known each other for a couple of years already. Mm -hmm. You're, uh, what, what do you want to, you can paint with as broad a stroke as you want since you've been, you're Chicago Joe, right? So <laughs> everybody knows who Chicago Joe Everyone is. Everyone knows. But uh, like, <clears throat> how's it been? You've been in this industry for a year. You've heard of this industry before, so you knew what it was. Is it what you thought it was going to be? No. I mean, I, I thought there would be, the industry, I thought there would be more structure. <laughs> um, I really, I mean, it, you're, you're to, it's the wild, wild west. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you made the point earlier around organizational structure and how there's swim lanes and their specialty that's been created. And I, I, I did not agree with you when you said, Hey, you don't need experience. And I was like, that's crazy. That's crazy talk. And I mean, listen, you, you can't get a job, um, you know, at certain financial organizations unless you have an Ivy League degree from, right. You know, in, in an MBA. So, you know, I'm thinking there's got to be some structure to this, and uh, and no, I mean it. It's, 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 it changes so volatile. It, it, I mean, obviously, on the build side, the you know the specialty side, you know, you you have to be a trained electrician. You can't just be some sales guy off the street going, "Hey, I want to plug something in." And, and we're not changing center. the way we deliver exactly, electrons. Yeah. Exactly, but from the support standpoint, I mean, we we hired uh, Marley. Who uh, congratulations, Marley, getting married in in three days, four days. But we hired Mary, uh, Marley Navy. Um, she a was sailor. An a she was an aviation bosun's mate. So yeah. she's oh shit, she's up there on the top of the carrier decks launching planes. Yeah. No way, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. so she has no. Uh, well, I'm not going to say that's not a technical background. I mean, you have to learn a lot about hydraulics and a lot of other things. But she's you're the one like moving aircraft around yeah. stuff on the deck. Yeah, so it's. The critical skill that she, like I say, I don't need experience with something specific for a data center because she came with a skill set that mm -hmm. is involved with life and death every day in her job. So the a critical uh, attention to detail mm -hmm. that she carries uh, was perfectly aligned to what we're doing because you wanted someone that was going to um, focus on the details a lot for what we needed from her. Mm -hmm. And you needed someone who had to have life and death to do it. I mean, that's the same reason why Jesse's, when you'd put Jesse on construction projects and a GMP in front of him, he was exceptional with it because he, no one, he's like, I remember one time Aunt Shap was, you know, giving a shit and he's like, 
everybody's going to go home tonight. No one's going to get shot. Mm -hmm. You know, like the stress is proportionate to what we're dealing with and we're going to be fine. Like we're worried about maybe a date slipping mm -hmm. for a day. We'll be okay. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's relative, but to your point, there are, uh, there are less values found in your Ivy League degree here. Not that your parents probably aren't still extremely proud of that, right? But you don't need any of those things here. And I'll tell you why, because if you were to go to school today to start learning about something about data centers, by the time that you graduated, whatever you were learning would be already be obsolete, yeah. right? So it just doesn't make a lot of yeah. sense. And this is uh, from, an, uh, from an MBA or a finance background. I mean, this is a very immature niche emerging f uh, asset right. class. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult for a lot of the analysts to understand how to interpret the value or what the risk thresholds are when they invest into this right. space. So I think right now you have a pool and everybody's kind of hovering around the pool, uh, waiting for someone else to jump in and tell them, well, it's safe in some cases, the herd mentality, mm -hmm. right? So when you got in here, I tried to explain to you, hey man, uh, it's not is the, the competitive landscape, it's not that it doesn't exist, but it's not as pent with other um, institutional or industrialized constructs, meaning like this is the way our industry works because it's the way it's always worked. Yeah. Fortunately for us, it doesn't work like that. It just changes. Like we have the ability to change the labor market mm -hmm. and we're a small agile company that's emerging with the industry, right? But we can be disruptive even at our speed because of our agility to change the way that people approach the need for talent, mm -hmm. right? And for you, now that you've gotten in here and you've seen how Wild Wild West is, what's your thoughts? Well, I mean, it's it's a growth, uh, it's a growth industry. And so, and that enables a lot of disruptors. So that's from a business standpoint, that's wonderful. And it creative, listen, there's not a bad idea. It's just, uh, it's just, you know, that we sort out those ideas and then you, you go to market with the, the good ones, but there's no bad ideas in this industry because it goes back to what you just said. There is no parable of the gorillas. There is no, this is the way that we do it because this is the way it needs to be done. Um, the, if you have an imagination and you're going to work hard and you can handle stress, you're going to succeed in this, in this industry. It's quite amazing. And um, you know, the, the, to your point, the pressure test, the, you know, making your bed every day, the responsibility that the military brings or, or instills that into a veteran is a, is an, you know, just a, a huge value for the, from a transition of what we call the battlefield to the data center space. I mean, it's just, it really is remarkable and, and we've seen it. So we're not just talking about us. Mm -hmm. we're there hasn't been an individual I have met yet that has been a transitioning or a transition veteran in this industry that hasn't been a home run. Yeah. When I, you think about it, I mean, do you know of any duds? I don't know of any duds. You know what I think it is, is, they're conditioned to be allowed to fail. Like in the military, we are, you train, 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 you fail, fail, fail. Like you know that failing is part of the growth, right? So stress testing, pressure inoculation, uh, that is healthy. Do you guys agree? Yeah. yeah. I think that's one of our advantages is you're in an environment where we fail and we fail forward in ways that could be life or death or catastrophic mm -hmm. to others around us. So, you know, you develop empathy even if you don't have it, but, no matter what you did, you were failing and you were okay with it. I think the reason why veterans do well as they transition out is one, um, they're used to working way more mm -hmm. when they're on active duty. I remember like a hundred hours in port, you know, if I was not deployed, mm -hmm. but the tempo that we operate at when we are deployed, like how much, when I was deployed, yeah, we did basic drills. We were always doing, you know, fire, steam line rupture, reactor scram, you know, all the various things that could happen on a submarine that would be life or death if you didn't have proficiency. But we weren't developing new skills on deployments. We were refining them and making them better. Dude, I didn't sleep for a week one time. Okay, was that because of training? No, we were on a mission. Okay. We were planning. And I literally, I was just, we were just go, go, go. I, and I, my team sergeant came up to me. We were like, 24 hours from like dropping in. And he was like, sir, you need to get some sleep. I'm like, what do you mean? Goes, you haven't slept for a week. I'm like, what, what do you mean? Like, yeah, it's been six days. And that's like, critical, man. Yeah. Especially when you're leading wow. people into yeah. combat. I had no like, idea. So, so I think that some of the veterans do well because they're used to being pressure tested mm -hmm. by a chief. I mean, think about it. Like 
if you, no one wants to yell at their kids or talk to their kids the same way a drill instructor does, but we all know when we ship our kids off to that, at that appropriate age, when they yeah. come back, they're different, yeah. right? They're different. <laughs> and, and that pressure testing is healthy. And I think that we all share that. Everyone mm -hmm. that's ever taken the oath and raised the hand, reserve, active duty, doesn't matter, National Guard. If you've done that, then you've put yourself in harm's way. And I think that you are uh, more likely to go try to, you're bolder, you have more courage to speak truth to power or to take a risk because you know that, hey, everyone's gonna go home today because no one's gonna die from this. So we could take bigger risks. And, um, and we're also not as afraid of failing, I think, because we know that we learned a lot from, we never learned anything from what we did right in the military. You, you actually learned when you did right, only when the guy standing next to you did wrong and they were getting yelled at you, it's still big, <laughs> you know, you're getting the collateral lesson learned, right? But, but you don't, do you think that's unique to us, to Overwatch, or is it industry wise? Well, I think that it's veteran wise. So it's unique to veterans or first responders or those mm -hmm. that are dependents upon them, right? Because, I mean, I ran into plenty of people that have a paramilitary type mindset, never once been in the military, but uh -huh. their parents were, or someone that they emulated was, yeah. and they get it. They understand the value of waking your bed in the morning uh -huh. and communicating effectively and being reliable and yeah. stuff. So this industry, I think uh, it, it has an advantage from the military is this. When we, what we were talking about in the first podcast was think about the the biggest challenge with this industry is that it grows and it outgrows every other industry because of every other industry. Every industry's growth comes back to this, mm -hmm. right? If you want to expand your e-commerce, you need more tech. If you yeah. want to have some sort of uh, video caching or streaming thing, you need more yeah. whatever tech. It all comes back to, I need more technology and, and all technology resigns back in a data center. So you have this industry that's growing at a double digit kager for the last mm -hmm. eight years. The demand for labor, that has never changed. And it's only gonna get worse with the adoption of AI, AR, VR, and all the other things, quantum computing. So we're in this, we're in this period where we're getting ready to hit another hockey stick of explosive growth. And we already know that we're standing at the threshold of what's called the silver tsunami. We're short mm -hmm. on labor. The talent for labor is growing every week. We have hundreds of thousands of people we're short at right now. And we have a lot of people rolling out of the military every year that are great to come from. Now, the thing that you have is an industry that is fractured. And I, I say it's unhealthy in this respect. When you are explosively growing, mm -hmm. it's like being on a deployment. When you're on a deployment, you weren't doing you were doing proficiency training, but mm -hmm. you weren't doing development training. You weren't being like, let's teach them how to drive the ship better. Yeah. Let's teach them how to shoot. They were like, do you still have your shit together? Stay proficient, because we're gonna need this soon. You know, you need muscle memory, you mm -hmm. need this, you need that. But they weren't saying, hey, let's reinvent you while you're over there, mm -hmm. right? Because that takes time and that means your pace, instead of producing an, an output, you know, now you're developing and your output and your productivity decreases when mm -hmm. you're in development. When you're in training mode, you're not, outputting and producing as much. So you have an industry that is just compressed schedule after compressed schedule, and we can't provide enough labor. We say there's a disparity, there's a talent gap, but it's not because people are getting dumber. I mean, in fact, studies prove that kids are way more sophisticated than they were when they were our age, maybe. So technology is advancing people, but technology is advancing so much faster. Innovation's advancing so much faster mm -hmm. than the advancement of humans that that's where that disparity and that gap is growing is we're not taking care of humans. We're not investing into people well enough. Well, the military does a pretty good job when you come back from deployments is they develop and train you. We'd come back from deployments and like, cool, you guys have a cool down period. Mm -hmm. Then we had a training development period. Then we had to get ready to get tested. To get, like we weren't going back on deployments just because we had a successful one. We mm -hmm. had to go test and make sure that we were ready to take the ship to sea and be safe and fulfill the missions. So the thing is, is there's cycles. Mm -hmm. and, the, and when you have an industry that grows as aggressively as ours, those companies are gonna shift off that cycle because they need to have more than their fair share of the wins. So they're gonna look at their labor force no longer as a, a, a contributing force to their culture that allows them to advance what they're doing. They're gonna look at the labor force as a piece of a machine and that is a piece of a cog that needs to be transparent, reliable, and predictable. And they know that the person that they put in that position, they're gonna burn out in a year or two, or maybe at max mm -hmm. three, and then they'll have to reboot that person and replace them. Now that person's gonna not go find a better job. They're just gonna find a job that pays them enough money to where it's worth suffering like that again, yeah. right? But 
we in the military, man, we, we had the flexibility to go change. I mean, every few years they shuffled us from one command to the next, right? Um, you're not going to stay at one command your whole life in the military. There's a reason why they even moved you around from bases. They didn't want the complacency that leads to mediocrity mm -hmm. to ever build in when you are so embedded in the same place, not evolving. The Rolling Stone has to, it's the only one that doesn't gather in the moss, right? So you need to be kinetic and you need to be disruptive in the way that you're developing talent. The military does that. You come back from deployments, the next thing you know, we were, I was getting trained on new skills. We were going off the simulations all the time. We were in simulator training for a month sometimes, mm -hmm. driving fake ships and doing, you know, it's, there is a constant need of development, but not during deployments. This industry has been in a full scale, nonstop deployment since I've been in it. Mm -hmm. And these companies are no longer investing their people and people are dropping off and then other people are collecting and inheriting broken people mm -hmm. that also are only there for the money because they're not there to get better, but they just, the circumstances are life for driving them forward. What we wanna do is apply the models that we got from the military into this. And veterans are gonna resonate with that already. Yeah. There's a lot of companies and operations that have veterans in their ranks, so they got, they have ranks, they have veterans in their human resources or in their sales or finance or marketing or whatever. Construction. They're everywhere. There's nine different job domains that represent 265 jobs just within our vertical of industry. There's veterans that touch every one of those bases, but they have a mindset, right? And our mindset is what we were talking about earlier. That's the advantage. If we could draw that mindset back in and we could start training and developing our talent better, I think that we won't have people leaving after three years. Mm -hmm. We'll have people that want to stay with us to lead yeah. others to that once they climb into the top of the hill their next their next duty and responsibility is to turn back around lean mm -hmm. down and grab someone and bring them up with them right left seat right seat mm -hmm. cockpit training that's what we talk about as veterans and that's the advantage that we have i think it it pencils well it, it mm -hmm. having veterans on your business i mean veterans didn't join the military to make money they did it to make a difference. And mm -hmm. if they leave and they're gonna come work for you, they're gonna probably wanna come work and make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that you could pay them less, but they are willing to, they just want an opportunity. They're willing to be paid proportion of their value day one. And as long as you give them opportunity to prove themselves, I've learned they show up early, stay late, volunteer for the hardest shit and will outwork most of well, the civilian they're willing to invest in the struggle. Well, they're used to it. Yeah, they're used to it. So they're willing to invest in the struggle. And again, to the point that there should there should be obviously an investment payoff for mm -hmm. that struggle that they're willing to invest in. And they will, right? They'll, they're will they going to earn, you know, that one thing, my one observation is it, this is significant income. Yeah. This is a legacy. This is family changing income because you're right. Military veterans did not join for the income or for the, for the top, the, opportunity to, to earn it's it's specifically to serve yeah. and and so they're taking all that all that skill set in and they do put in this investment especially in an organization like Overwatch where where you know we are cha we're a game changer we're a disruptor but that comes with the cost of of personal investment both your time and your energy because we know that there's going to be a growth component to all of this and the reality is these guys will these when i say guys in unisex way they will earn and they will part be part of that earn process yeah um because the the, the scale is higher in this industry from an earning standpoint for a transitioning veterans than candidly many there's a lot of organizations that would love to take in veterans at a very large chunk. However, they're they're not willing to offer them the income commensurate to the responsibilities that they're going to take. Right. They actually think because they were in the military and that their hour, their hourly wage was so reduced, but they don't realize it's 24 hours and all mm -hmm. your all of your personal all expenses, food, all uh, everything's yeah. included. But even what, if you pencil that and you still come to a comparison, they're trying to really get to that mark where it's just an increase over what an E5 was making. Yeah. In, and so those industries have missed the boat and they're not on, they're not seeing the value of the veteran. They're looking at this as it's a handout almost. Right. Yeah. And you know, that's an interesting that. component. I think too, I think the, one of the reasons that veterans like the industry so much is, you know, in the military, you call it like a shared suck experience, right? You know, yeah. it's a really large company. Us, I love yeah, how much it yeah. sucks here. All, all of us. <laughs> well, hang on. I'm going to get to what I mean. Like, even though 
you had to do things that were hard. You had to work late. You had to do X, Y, or Z in the military, right? It was a shared experience yeah. with it brings people you, you like that, you know, and, and you were just doing something together. Anybody that has been up against an IST date in construction, anybody that's been in operations and has Back been dealing testing, with a failure or, you know, an outage. Yep. I mean, those, they're different, but they're the same, right? I mean, it's still an experience, pressure. a high stress, pressure filled environment. And there's, there's very few places and in industries that you find that, you know what I mean? There's, there's, there's not a lot of places where you get it to that degree, I'll say, right? Like you're a hundred percent right. And in, in the military, you know, you, you rate uptime by mortality, right? How many other industries, you know, besides mission critical, do you even really measure uptime? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Do you do you really even measure the ability to be, let's call it combat ready? Right. There's not a lot. Hospitals, yeah, I mean healthcare. Yeah. Yep. I got you. But I get your point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like we can we tend to come in with a greater appreciation for the attention and detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Hundred percent. And we're used to being like my son went to the Citadel and he was worried one day about the cadre there. And the cadre are notorious at those military academies, as mm -hmm. you know for uh, the pressure that they're able to put on a, on a knob or a cadet. And he was really worried about it one day. And I'm like, mm. he was born and raised in a family where every man in his lineage is military. I'm like, I promise you, there's no members of the cadre there at that school that will be able to haze you worse than any of the members of the men in your family mm -hmm. that have all been in the military, <laughs> myself included. Mm -hmm. You know, like there ain't a member, there's not a sophomore in junior in college that could haze a kid better than a veteran who's mm -hmm. been through the best by trained professionals at hazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like those RDCs and those drill instructors, like, man, if you got a good one, I I mean, I don't know what a bad one looks like, but that's their job is mm -hmm. to create, to just break people down and build them back up and send them out to be productive in a society. That society happens to be the military mm -hmm. community, right? But God, that's a factory. That's a manufacturing plant for humans and it takes eight to 12 weeks to do it. Yeah. I mean, if they don't score high enough on their ASVAB, it was <clears throat> 12 weeks? 18. Yeah, see? But I was, I was literally gonna ask you like, when you're signing up, right? Like, how do you make the decision? Like, how do you look at your paperwork and be like, I can be infantry or I can be support. You know what I mean? Like what, what's that like? I mean, I know he you believes that everybody, that's, every, that's, every other branch of service. If you've never heard Jesse Sargent's <laughs> philosophy on military, <laughs> if you look Shut at the, up. if you Everybody's look at MOS, just, every element of the military is designed to support infantry. Every 100%. branch is like, listen, well, armor too. Used to be. Yeah. yeah. We have our own army. The Navy has its own. It's huh? what is that? The department of the Marine Corps. <laughs> the Marine Corps is the Department of the Navy. Did you all know that? I mean, I And did. we have our own I, Air Force. Like, we are self-sustaining. Uh, we don't need, and we have a nuclear military. Did yeah. you know the Army has more airplanes than the Navy does? 100%. No chance. Totally. More aircraft with helicopters, but not more airplanes. Maybe more aircraft. Not fixed wing. Yeah. But I hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you guys have a bunch of short buses to fly everyone around in on the air all the time because all you bullet sponges have to be somewhere, I guess. Not everyone was it's kind of important. Have. You know what I mean? Like not all of us just get to ride around under the water and, and change history. <laughs> yeah, I get it. You know, I'm sure they'll write books about you guys, but um, no, there you're right. I mean like the whole, everything, Jesse had this whole thing with all of his other friendly bullet sponges that everything ties back to infantry, everything that you do. It's like in the air force. Like if you're in the air force and you're out in the cockpit, your job is to make sure that those planes are in the air flying. Right. So you're supposed to think that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we're the nuclear deterrent, dude. I mean, like no one gives a shit about how many of you guys would get on a plane and fly. Like we stop. If you do look at the operations of just a functional building and you then align the military services or the groups to a functional building. Are you going right, to say the army's right. the trash room? Well, well I'm, I'm right. I am going <laughs> to say, rude. listen, because, you know, I, I have well, joined the army because my, my, my dad. Military intelligence so, is the best so, part. But here's what's interesting. If we were aligning the janitors would be the army <laughs> and the operations would be, you know, more on the Navy and the Air Force, and they would be Air running. Air Force would be administration. They would be, yeah, exactly, be administration. And But when you think about it, I mean, Army would be, you it's know. Matters. I'm not saying that the Army, because I am, I love the Army, we're the lowest common denominator, but we are the entry level <laughs> of the military. 
Oh, across the board. Can you speak into the it's, microphone? It's not right the here most elite. Hey. It's not the most elite. Is that group. A, like a reserve or a national? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> Coming from this 100% said, reservists. Uh, hey, that. reservists are people too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I um. I can see where you'd get that only working on the weekends. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, every now and then. But I'll tell you, I. Uh, we, I'm really excited to bring, we have an Air Force person coming on to the management team for the first time. We've had Air Force people at our company before, but having a, an Air Force person, every branch of the military, I believe, is like a completely different branch mm -hmm. of a vertical of industry. You know, I'm like, I don't think, there, there are so many differences between the Navy and the Army, right? And so many more, I mean, the Army and the Air Force were one, mm -hmm. what, right? So. There's just so many differences. I I tell people to look at each branch of service, not like, depending on the broad stroke as a veteran, I'm like, nah, not every branch is different. I mean, I really think that the army does the best job of training leaders. Mm -hmm. I think the Marine Corps trains great uh, leaders as well, but they also train you to follow really well. Mm -hmm. I think that the Navy and the Air Force are more intellectual. Yeah. Where you have kids that can do long division, go to MIT and can barely pass the push ups, and they're fucking officers. Mm -hmm. You guys wouldn't have that in the infantry. If they, just because they're smart, they would not. Be, does that make sense? Yeah. But you couldn't get. You, he just got you guys to admit that the army is less than on the smarts. <laughs> so somebody can fact check me on this. Oh, here we go. You might be able check. to. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure. 60% the, time, it works every I'm, time. I'm pretty sure the infantry has the highest concentration of high ASVAP scores. You tell yourself that. Yeah, you guys all tell yourselves that. Yeah. Yeah, you should. Does that make you feel good? Well, I think what <laughs> I it can is, is like, to Look, there is a Santa too. If you haven't heard, I mean, he's around. He's all, he's jolly as fuck. So I saw him. George Costanza? I'll tell you, there are some really smart uh, leaders I've met from the military, but I'll tell you, there's some big fat brains on the submarine community for sure. Oh, sure. Right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it's uh, all fun and games. But the Air Force too has, you know, the Space Force and all that shit. So they had a lot of long division kids in there as uh -huh. well. Like Caden was like, there's a kid at the Citadel that he's going to school with. He's a senior who's going to Space Force. And he goes, yeah, the guy's like, they don't have enough classes there to challenge these kids sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like, let's just tell him that he doesn't do enough push ups or some shit. They mm -hmm. have to push him somehow. Cause intellectually there's people that just get it. They just have the doors open and yeah. everything comes in, right? I have a funny story about someone teaching me to be a hazer. Because oh, the there's military. an actual school for this? So there's actual, because you know how the military <laughs> like saying, responsibility to is to pass on the hazing <laughs> yeah. to the next guy. I was professionally trained by a man who, who had all of my three step ahead chess moves, uh, uh, prank Sinatras are all because of this fucking guy. He's all right, let's hear this story. He taught me well. This is, this is the time so, of the podcast uh, where- I think Corporal uh, Greg Garbo- if he's listening right now, you're a dick, but <laughs> <laughs> he was my mom's second husband. And what was interesting about this dude was he was a Chicago guy. Uh, he shot himself when he was like 11 playing with his mom's gun. He's the, he's the, he's the kid that everyone would, parents would say, not do the things that Greg did. And your mom the, married him. And my mom ended up marrying him, but this was, you know, this guy was right out of the Marines. He was 22 years old and my mm. mom was like in her late thirties. So this was the beginning of my mom marrying boy toys. But hold on a second. If you don't know this, how old is your stepdad? Uh, my stepdad's 48 now and my mom so is uh, 75. <laughs> So um, <laughs> that's younger than you didn't know that. <laughs> you didn't, yes. he's pretty, yeah. Even yeah. Jesse's Ohio yeah. math was like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Right? She is she is the headquarters for a Cougar. She is the, yeah. she's the chapter member of the Cougar Club. You got so, a picture? <laughs> <laughs> Infantry. So so this dude. So this is current. I meet this. Well, no, this was this was when I was step kicked awesome. This in like oh, World War Oh, my dude. He'll go to dinner yeah, with yeah. his stepdad's here and be like, hey, dad, you got dinner? <laughs> <laughs> so this this dude comes into my life, and it was right when it was like eighth grade. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, I think, yes, it was eighth grade. So through that process, going through high school, and then I had the situation where I had to join the military, I didn't know I was ha I had to go to basic training. 
I thought, hey, I'm going to join ROTC and this is going to solve all of my problems. Well, the recruiter, I'm not saying he lied, he didn't give me the full truth. He was like, listen, you're going to do a split up program. You're going to become an enlisted and you'll be enlisted through your school, you but you'll be a cadet through that process too. Yeah. And that's how you're going to get your school paid for during that. And you get a little stipend check and you report to a reserve duty uh, station. So point being was I had to then quickly get ready last minute for basic training. So I didn't have a lot of preparation. This dude came to me, oh, let me help you with all this. This is going to be wonderful. And really, I I took my I re, I released my guard. I had no guard from this guy now. Mm-hmm. And I was like, dude, just fucking so kind of you, right? He was a Marine. I looked up to him a little bit. I was like, that's really awesome. But leading up to that, he did a lot of effed up stuff to me and my brother and my sister, just screwing with us, pranks beyond belief. That I was like, I'm glad you clarified. That. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and I really, I really started to trust him at this point. And he goes, I just listen. I got experience. Make sure that I get all your information so I can send it to you because I'll make sure you get the, you know, the the goodie packages oh. to really, to really. So I'm like this. I'm like, that's bad. And this, how beautiful! It's like going to basic training. I'm scared shitless. Didn't know I have to go in because in 1990 they mm-hmm. they did hit you. Not to say they didn't do it in the later end. <laughs> they threatened to hit you. And I, I'm sure you were scared of that, but they you actually hit us. Hit I had a knife <laughs> held to my throat. Right. So, Same drill, Sergeant. The, so the point being is first mail call. First mail call. It's very first one. Very first mail call. Private pins on. Private pins on. Here's your fucking envelope. And the envelope is just tattered with perfume dicks all over the letter <laughs> saying, yeah. I can't believe you left me. You're running from me. And Greg took a Polaroid picture of his butthole. <laughs> <laughs> and because this letter was so ridiculous, <laughs> of course, the fucking drill sergeant opened it for me in front of everyone and read this. And from that point on. You were gay, Joe. I was gay Joe, Joe, but with an F word, Joe, Mm -hmm. which you can't use today, but I was F Joe. And that was fucking it. It's awesome. The stuff that would come in the mail. Yeah dildos and <laughs> it was just and they would be confiscated and finally how did we meet your mom's ex-husband finally <laughs> yeah, the really. true sergeant realized that well, there was a serviceman that was fucking with me this entire yeah, yeah, yeah. time so oh, did he figure it out uh, well you know i was like this drill sergeant he, he was like this what is going on i go this dude's a marine and he was like <laughs> he's nailing <laughs> well, my mom dude. So, hey, did you ask him that? he's like well let me ask you a question i think that we all were wondering like how did you know that was his Fart button. Well, <laughs> that's the thing. It, it, you know. Never mind. I, well, I was thinking. Podcast. <laughs> right. You know like, how hard that had to have been back in the day with a Polaroid? You He's know? like, listen, man. Like, it, well, no, yeah, it, that's him. Mom took yeah. a picture. It, it could have been. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> been. Well, <laughs> this is the veteran podcast. We go Dude, all we want. What, so, my last name being Sergeant. Right? Oh, can you imagine going to boot camp? Oh, my God. God. Hey, was, As a private. It was fucking Sergeant, bro. So, like, when they would do mail for me, they like you know they'd do mail call and they'd like you said call out people's names they'd uh get to me and they'd look at it and they'd just go <laughs> flip it at me and wouldn't say my name they'd be like i'm not saying your fucking name i, I had deserve uh, it so obviously i'm the youngest of a bunch of boys all my brothers were uh, the only one that wasn't active duty at the time was at west point right and um i got letters that i think you know that you go to spencer's in the mall or something probably get it but I didn't even know what it was. I got hazed. It basically, I got an envelope from uh, the president of NAMBLA. <laughs> and I didn't know what NAMBLA was. So I'm getting yelled at. I was beat before I even understood. And finally, in the end, I'm like, hey, man, who could tell me what the hell N-A-M-B-L-A stands for? The North American Man Boy Love Association. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it. Hey, re- hey, look, it's real. It exists. Because uh, there must have been something going on that was big in those days. Because I remember it was on Saturday Night Live. They were doing skits and stuff. But um. Yeah, it's crazy. By the way, if you get on their that sounds like a name. You get on their mailing <laughs> list. If you get on their mailing fair. list, you can't unsubscribe. They just continue to push it. I'm gonna put it's you unbelievable. On the list. How do I not know this? I every every weekend, I'm like this. Unsubscribe. They just fill up my inbox. Unsubscribe, and it won't unsubscribe. It's unbelievable. <laughs> you have no idea. The greatest joy of my life has been sending things to Jesse. Like people will try to 
pin things down. Like Jesse actually wants to talk to you about that. In fact, he was just asking me about that this morning. Can, here's this is his phone number. This is his home number. This is hey, I <laughs> shit you not. There was one guy <laughs> called me every other day for a year and a half. And he would call me every other day when he wasn't calling him. And I'd be like, that's the weirdest thing. Cause I just talked to him when he was asking me about you today. <laughs> He'd be like, he's really busy. You just got to stay on him. Like he wants to talk, like just keep calling. I and think he, that guy actually called us like a month ago. And this dude would, he would call me every fucking day. I love guys that don't quit like mm -hmm. that though. You should have given him some work. You're an asshole. What kind of work was it? <laughs> I'm not going to say. So that way, <laughs> that way it can't be narrowed down. But 100%, but, what makes the military guys this way? What happened? At what point did we all accept, not only are we going to serve the country, yeah, but we're yeah. going to pass on from this point forward mm -hmm. the most unbelievably Bizarre. So here's the Stories. deal. Listen, I don't know who originates, but you you have sent some brilliant, you know, his pictures where you think, and it's like, there's a, something going on right now. Mm -hmm. Some events going on right now, okay. and we're all at fucking pins and needles. We don't know what's going to go on. And you and it, you have to hit the fucking news article to get the details of it. And then it, what's there is not what you expect, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> First of all, someone is sitting around making those authoring these things mm -hmm. yeah. like oh, yeah. what the fuck you know and then they're pushing it somehow the it supply it chain my children <laughs> supply the supply chain gets the ko oh, I'm a, and then I'm a filter for and then it goes back out so it comes in and goes back out well the one time he had one and <laughs> it was about ice in t texas and we're all gonna die so i immediately go <laughs> shit i need to send this one to my mom oh no and my and everyone <laughs> without my, opening without oh without oh wait, wait, wait it gets better <laughs> without opening it and so he he <laughs> this dude decides to send it to the pastor and everyone in the congregation the church. oh my god it's in the important. church <laughs> It, and I've opened those. That is not something that went into the church. So but this, dude, last, this last one, I was like, this last one came across very selective with my mailing list. Yeah. I was like, this my brother. And here's what's fucked up about my brother sending it to my brother. I sent it to my brother, American Family Insurance, the entire week, cyber attack, their entire week when they were down. Not one day, not 38, not, they had a ransom that they paid, but it took an entire week. They couldn't pay, they couldn't receive money in, anyone who had insurance claims. This is a multi-billion dollar company down for an entire week. And I sent him on the last day, the Kirk, the, the last thing on, on, uh, on Israel, and I sent it to him. And he gets a visit because he opened it up at work he gets a visit from the IT people going like this, dude, what did you just get? <laughs> they opened it because they were all looking through every nook and cranny, oh, and he no. and he didn't get to open it. He got so pissed at me. So yeah. the point <laughs> being is every time I send it out, it ends up, it's brilliant, and I immediately send it out, <clears throat> but it ends up snapping me. You want to know why? <laughs> I think I know why military it's just people a, actually, come up with these things, right? Like I'm convinced all those articles are made by somebody that was in the military. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 because like dude so many times on like bro i had a dude drink like juice out of my belly button to get a cigarette in the, <laughs> you know what i mean hey, listen, on deployment yeah listen my can i tell one of my favorite stories right so i was tanner same age as your daughter uh he's at that point in his senior year where he's thinking about hey man I do, do i want to go to college or do i want to enlist in the military right and uh you know, every, we had this great conversation and I had to stay back to have some tests done. They, uh, I was going through a patch. These two guys just kind of knew that I was worried about some health stuff. So they pop in unsolicited. You flew in from Ohio and yeah. he calls me up. He's like, Hey man, Anthony and I are down the street. We're running bound to come hang with you. I'm like, what in the literal fuck? Mm -hmm. So, uh, it was Tanner sat in the backyard with us. Right. Mm -hmm. And just, we were sharing some bourbon and Caden, our Tanner had some questions about being in the military. And I said, why don't you ask Jesse and Anthony about the army? One was an officer and one was enlisted. And why don't you share the story that you share with, you want me to share the story? I'll share it. <laughs> I said, hey, I said, hey, listen, if you want to know the difference between officer and enlisted, okay. Enlisted, you try and jerk off in the porter party as fast as you can so you don't pass out <laughs> from the heat. 
<laughs> and officers just do it in their air conditioned shoes. <laughs> so, like, that's the way it works. You know what I mean? Like he's like, you got to walk in though. And but before pod. you got to take a Gatorade bottle in with you so you can push the turds down into the toilet. So you got a place to sit. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. He said when he came back from the Middle East, he goes, yeah, the biggest concern the soldiers have is that they'd be afraid that they wouldn't be able to be aroused unless some girl farted in their face or something like that, you know, because you've been sat out there in the heat with the, the porta potties and your brakes, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but that's, you'll never hear a civilian talk about that story. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't, like the first three years I worked at HP, man, you have no idea how hard it was. I'm like, mm. yeah, but they well, don't get, they don't have the opportunity to do stupid oh, shy submarines do what you guys are yeah. doing about planes when, i'll never forget so like when i was deployed was uh when the do you guys remember the red bull red red bull commercials where it'd be like welcome to my world the world of red bull you know what i mean well we're all in afghanistan and we're yeah. like bro we can fucking knock this commercial out you know what <laughs> i mean like they're gonna want this mm -hmm. So uh, for anybody that knows what a Mark 19 is, yeah. uh, it's a belt-fed uh, grenade, grenade launcher, launcher. right? And normally they're <laughs> mounted on a vehicle or on a tripod. These were on a vehicle. Well, if you know if you know how to use them, you have to charge it, and it has a ghost round, and you hit the butterfly, and it racks back, and then you charge it again, and then it's live, right? Well, uh, we're like... Let's do a commercial with the Mark 19. You know, like, this will be awesome. What could go wrong? Yeah. What could go wrong? And uh, so we're like at this strong point, and I'm up on this Mark 19. My buddies are crying. I'm like, welcome to my world, the world of Red Bull. And I charge it, and I go ghost round, and I hit the butterfly, and it goes, do, 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 do. And I was like, uh. I like looked down at him, and we just like climbed down, and all of a sudden in the distance, you just, bah, 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 bah. And I was like, you have no idea what you hit. <laughs> not a not a fucking clue. <laughs> hey, my there could have been a guy delivering mm -hmm. a pizza on a bike newspapers. Yeah. And you hit the I don't kid. think they deliver newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's how they get their news. <laughs> what was the story where uh hold on, that's not the best one. The best one was when you were playing Xbox once. Right? Yeah, yep. Yeah. So me and uh so at the time where, where we were at in Afghanistan, at the time, it was the most kinetic place in the world, right? So we got in firefights every day. Um, but <laughs> you just get used to it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm not, like, listen, not sounding mm -hmm. oorah or anything like that at all. Like, it, you just get used to it. You're trained for it. You eventually get used to it. Um, and so... <laughs> It was our downtime, which you had very little of, and we happened to have a generator at the time, and we hooked up a TV and an Xbox to it. So me and my buddy are playing Xbox, and we're sitting there, and like we hear the gun, <laughs> the gunfire start happening outside the <laughs> outside the cop, and we kind of look at each other and we're like, ah, oh, fuck it, and we just keep <laughs> playing, you know what I mean? And it just keeps going, keeps going, and then all of a sudden, round comes through the tent. Slams into the fucking Xbox. No way. <laughs> Hand to God. Stand up, fucking slam my controller on the ground, go out and get my shit and go to the wall and start shooting. You know what I mean? But, uh, <laughs> oh, dude. Launch into there was, there was, yeah. There was one time where, uh, we and our first sergeant got so pissed because when I tell you we shot a thousand 203 rounds, like, like no joke there's like 10 dudes on the wall in our underwear with just belts around us <laughs> with mark with the 203s just like yeah. trying to fucking lob them at this like dude <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was awesome it was awesome you have any crazy stories we'll go around the horn and everyone has to share at least one story mm, I, don't know. I mean crazy story i had was probably it was my first real mission so we were jumping out of an airplane uh into china uh, jumping out at 34,000 feet. Oh, so that's Halo? Uh-huh. Well, this, this was Hey-Ho. We were like, so it was, what we were trying to do is- Don't talk to me like that. <laughs> <laughs> so high altitude, high opening. So we were going to fly for a long way. And and so I jumped out and I was like halfway through the stick. There was like 10 of us. Um, and so you're, we opened up super fast, right? And so we were going to open up at like 30 um, so we could fly for about- Dude, that'd be awesome, actually. Is that cool? I oh, mean, you're super on oxygen. Dope. Super dope. Yeah, it's completely black. So, you know, I mean, you're literally out of the ocean and there's nothing. And we do it when there's no moon, What's right? What's it like falling through a cloud? Small clouds you fall through. Okay. Big clouds like the thunderheads and stuff like that, you don't fall through those because they have like wind currents going on in there. For know? real? Oh, yeah. Like the big column on a thunderhead, 
You, know, you don't know what that creates at? That's the air condenses when it hits that top, the top of the atmosphere at like 90,000 feet and then just falls to the ground. And so that's what makes rain. And so that air is falling at like 100 plus miles an hour. You get into that and you're like, yeah, you're toast. You're ruined, especially if you have a parachute up. We're covering a lot of, now we're in the science uh, section <laughs> it's of It's like the... how it's made. It's, it's like a <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just yeah. want to know if you could feel it. You know what I mean? When you go through you the feel pump. the moisture on your skin. Yeah. Yeah. Are you in a dry suit you when you're running like that? Huh? When you're jumping that altitude, how cold is it up there? Uh, I don't, I you're mean, jumping out at negative temperatures probably. No, I mean, it was cold, but you're, I mean, just, I don't know. Okay, but you're yeah, just, be... yeah, I mean, we had oxygen on. <clears throat> I mean, it was. I got you. Yeah. That's cool. All right, so I interrupted yeah. you because no, that sounds. No, it's good. But yeah, so I, I jump out, main doesn't open. And so I feel the pull of it. You can't see shit because it's dark, right? It's dragon. Yeah, it's just dragging. And and so I'm watching the altimeter, you know, I'm like at 27,000 feet now. And so you have a choice, right? Either like pull pull the reserve, well, jettison the main and then pull the reserve. The reserve can't fly. The reserve is just gonna like get you down safely. And so, you know, what we trained was main doesn't open, you're just gonna fucking fall to the ground, fall to the ocean. And so we had long swim fins on so we could swim really fast for for this contingency and so i was like all right pop the main and just fell to the ocean because i knew i knew where we were going i knew where they would hit the boat and so i knew i could swim my ass off to try to meet them and so i just popped the main and just rode the reserve down no i did i rode nothing all the way down to about two thousand feet pulled the reserve just to slow my fall into the water. And then normally what you do, especially for reserve, is you just blow, pull the reserve right before you hit the water. So you can like come out from underneath it. Fell in the water, dropped my ruck because I, I knew we had ammo and everything in the boat and stuff. Put my fins on, followed my little swim GPS and just swam my fucking life. You away. just let your ruck sink in the ocean? Yeah, I did. Bro, see, that's the difference between special forces. And regular <laughs> army. You don't come back with your ruck in the regular army. You better just not come back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I knew I had nods, and I kept my nods yeah, with yeah. me, and kept my weapon with me, and just swam like a motherfucker. Yeah. And so for six hours, did you have to pay? You swam for six hours to go meet the troops. Uh -huh. Did you have to What's pay the CIF velocity? for that gear? What What's that? Did you have to pay CIF for that gear? <laughs> no, I didn't. Okay, I was just curious. <laughs> What's the terminal velocity when you drop forward. at that high altitude? Like 120. Okay. Yeah. So that's still a long drop though. It was a long way. So that's gotta be a pretty cor crazy story. So yeah. and then that's nuts. ridiculous. What and then was totally what, did you get hazed? Did you get hazed for not for your shooting up? I would have for sure right? tried to float no, closer uh -uh. to the boat. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, we don't yeah. pack them. So it's some quartermaster dude that packed it for us. And then, you know, I checked it out and everything looked fine. We we're doing, got JMPI. It just shit happens. Do you go back and be like, hey, bro, fuck you. I had to swim <laughs> six miles. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it was, it was, I mean, it was like, Six hours. Oh swimming. yeah, six hours. Oh. Yeah, I mean the crazy thing was I was probably like a hundred yards off from where the timing that I needed to be, and so I kept some IR flares with me because I knew something would in case I needed something right. And we're all wearing nods, so I got within. I knew the timing and I was just watching it. I got within. I could see them on the GPS and stuff. I got within about a hundred yards and just started popping IR flares. So they could see me, and then I saw them turn around and come pick me up, and save my life. But yeah, that's crazy shit. Would they have left you? Totally. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been fish bait. Did you ever see sharks during that six-hour swim? No, it was dark, man. That the hardest part is swimming in the open ocean. Navigating. It, it is under just appreciating the currents because if you haven't like swum in the ocean. Especially at night, like, I mean, it's it's almost like if you've seen those videos of dudes at scuba school to where they put blackout goggles on and then like spin you around, like that's what it's like <clears> swimming <throat> in the open ocean because the currents are just, you're moving all around. Like you'll be, I'll, I'll watch the speed on the GPS and they'll be, fuck, I'm swimming like 10 miles an hour. And you just happen to be on a current. In a current, right? And then there'll be times you're like, negative what? <laughs> what are like the <laughs> swells out there? Like. Well, I mean, we're, so that stuff, we're like 15 to 20 feet down. And so it's, I mean, you'll still, you'll feel the sense of movement is all there. I mean, so there'd be times where you feel yourself like come up. Yeah. There'd be times to where I would be out of the water. Oh, I'm sure. I'm just in there swimming, just kicking like a motherfucker. And then you just come out and I'm like, <laughs> just splash in the water, man. 
Because there'd See, be like I a think, 15, 20 I foot think swell. That, so here's the deal. Let's say that I'm Hamas and I'm just chilling. I'm about to fucking fight. And, you know, listen, I'm about to poke the bear on American military and we're going to get into a fight. All I got to do is, is the hum- hear one story from one fucking guy and go like this. <laughs> We don't do any of that shit. Here. <laughs> well, wait, a wait a second. What what kind of training are we? I mean, we got the shit that we stole from the playground <clears throat> where we do some bars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you not see them do the <laughs> monkey bars? <laughs> yeah. Hey, not we're, bad. We're, yeah. Hey, not bad. Hey, not bad. I mean, I mean, uh, Hashif over here can do some mean fucking tires, but this motherfucker, right? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Your story would be a war mitigator. They'd be like, this, oh, we're not fighting with these motherfuckers. Well, they stood for six <laughs> hours. This is how the Shane Gillis thing, like. All of us being military guys, yeah. right? And uh, did, were you in combat? Yeah. Were you okay? Were you Joe? No. Okay. <laughs> I don't need to ask you, but I was just, no because like here's what makes Shane Gillis's thing so funny is like when he's like you know like I can relate to those guys more. You know, like, like the real they, heroes, they do something good, and they're like, oh, you know, I mean? <laughs> oh, it's true, it's true. Like when they do when they do something good, like they just lose their fucking mind. They're like, ah. You know, I mean, that's what makes it so funny. No, he's like, they're the real, they're the real fucking brave guys. I mean, they're out there fighting America in their <laughs> pajamas and f- sandals, just getting wasted. Yeah, he's like, and then <laughs> the we best come part in is, with a helicopter. Like, we, oh. we had a guy that worked on our team that was a SEAL that uh, we went to that we went to see Rogan here in Austin, yeah. and Gillis was working on that show before it yeah. made Netflix, so we got to watch that live. And Gillis had more to that. Oh, yeah. That whole bit, and it was hilarious because the one that was with us, he wasn't laughing nearly as hard as I was. Were you with that one with me? Mm-hmm. Where, uh, which one? It was the uh, one where Shane Gillis and I. I think, uh, I think it was you and me. And okay, uh, you saw it then. Yeah, yeah, it was a good one. Um, all right, well, look, your turn. Do you got any cool stories during training when they go and they? I remember uh, at reserve duty, um, <laughs> and the uh, food truck didn't show up on time and um it's almost chaos you know <laughs> i remember the first sergeant who was a dentist at the time was, was really dad the command was, master was, chief? he was the command sergeant major and you know all these guys have full-time gigs right and they're uh it's like so rainbow yeah so the food truck didn't come and we got pissed so we all went to mcdonald's that sounds great. That's a pretty crazy story. Yeah. I don't know how. I'll, ta- hey, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. McDonald's that's story. that's what happens at, at, on reserve duty. No, but it it is funny though. It is the biggest uh, waste of. I I get that we're on reserves yeah. for to be so we yeah, can enter into a situation where we would need assistance, but they don't do anything ever. You didn't do anything? Yeah, we get uh, get in line. Fucking after that, fucking go sit and go someplace soft to sleep all day. <laughs> That's what we did. Man, every there's a lot of day. reservists that did a lot more mm-hmm. than that, though. So, well, I don't know about that, but but not in the nineties, though. Not right? in the nineties. I got you. Yeah, yeah. Was oh. it the nineties or the eighties? Listen, the guys that are, are saying they talk did to you a lot like of that? stuff. <laughs> the guys that are saying that they did a lot of stuff, they're just maybe creating a little more excitement to their. No, no, yeah, they're just drama queens. Yeah, they're just, you. you know, they're just saying it was a little bit more exciting. But are they talking about us? I don't think so. I don't think so either. I get, dude. So you were just talking about McDonald's when I was in basic training. Uh, my dad gave me some good advice and some bad advice before I went. You know what I mean? Some, he'd never been in the military. I don't know. Did you say you sure to go to McDonald's? No. On Fort Benning? He said volunteer for everything. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Horrible idea. <laughs> Horrible idea. I didn't know that. You know what yeah. I mean? At the time, I'm like, all right, dad, I'll do that. Well, uh, it ended up working out all right for me. But one time we were out on a field exercise. and uh, By the way, that's what it sounds like when I get my... <laughs> Toenails done. Is that it? Right there. I was like, that's, that's how, here? When, I'm, when I'm getting my Annie Cuddy, that's what it sounds like when they get to my toes. <laughs> you hear that? Using a drum. Like dumb and dumber. <laughs> but uh, anyways, I they asked for a volunteer. We're out on a field exercise. And I go running over. And it's the only time that my dad's advice paid off for me. Okay. About volunteering for everything. I get there and I run up. And immediately they're like, start doing pushups to the drill sergeants. And I'm the only one, I'm the only, you know, soldier there. And uh, in my mind, I'm like, great, dad, great advice again. Thank you. <laughs> and I start doing pushups and they unwrap a McDonald's cheeseburger and put it down like underneath me, underneath Shut my up. face while I'm doing pushups. Oh, yeah. And they're like, hey, you volunteer for everything. And we knew 
that you would run over here. <laughs> so as long as you're doing push-ups, you can eat that fucking cheeseburger, but you can't tell anybody. <laughs> so I had cool. to do push-ups, and every time I went down, I'd take a bite That's of the fucking so funny, cheeseburger. Holy cow. But it was because I volunteered for everything. Did Should I tell them the story about when I was on uh, CQ? For like sure. All right, yeah. so... <laughs> This goes back to the, having the last name Sergeant in basic training. Not a good idea, right? Uh, I think it's no stranger to anybody that's been in the military that military people, you know, will have a few drinks from time to time, you know? While I was in basic training, I was on battalion staff duty. And when you're on battalion staff duty and somebody calls, they have like a a, a narrative that you read off of, right? And it's blah, 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 blah you know. I'm private sergeant how can i help you and as soon as private sergeant comes out of my mouth this guy goes are you fucking with me right now and i was like uh no sir and he goes how do you know i'm a fucking sir Oof. and i'm like oh. he's like i'll be there in five minutes and i was like god damn it this dude comes in he's like an e8 and oh, yeah, the meanest same, ones. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is at Benning. And is that a first sergeant? Uh, he yeah, is master, master sergeant. sergeant. Yeah. yeah. So uh, he's, he's a master sergeant, which just not a, in a first sergeant role. Yeah. Okay. And, but he was some kind of secret squirrely something, right? And uh, he proceeds to just absolutely fucking berate me for an hour because my last name was sergeant. You brought that on yourself. Yeah. <laughs> It's funny now, though. It is funny now. Yeah, I think it's funny now. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I was when I was at my line unit, mm -hmm. uh, did it ever pay off for you or benefit? Oh, hundred percent. When I was at my line unit, and new privates would show up, like this was after I had been there for a little bit, and you know, people liked me, and uh, people would show up, and you know, when you're in your CQ, you don't have to wear your your top all the time right and so we'd have our tops off like cleaning guns or whatever and uh they just use your last name 100 percent. they'd just use my <laughs> last name and like new privates and stuff would come in and like they'd like stand at parade rest to talk to me and shit and i'd be like that's fucking right <laughs> <laughs> fucking learn your place <laughs> so so my story <laughs> is i showed up to my submarine in, in portsmouth to hamster kid remain the memphis had ran uh a ground uh barrier reef maybe um no some some reef in florida maybe um but anyways it it, it had a full smash of the sonar array the sonar oh, wow. dome right not the array but the dome itself and uh they pull it back into the portsmouth naval shipyards to do a massive retrofit on it and if you're going to do that you might as well put some other toys on it right yeah. and um i was coming out of submarine school you know there's so many of us we get to pick our billets and my instructors were single guys that uh i had a brother at west point so uh i figured hey it'd be cool to be in the east coast i'd be able to see him if i stayed in new london connecticut um, but originally I was trying to get to Hawaii, right? I'm mm -hmm. like, dude, everyone that you talk to, can you imagine being a single guy and the say, you know, it yeah. sounds like a pretty, pretty awesome opportunity. Right. So I was really leaning in that direction. And, uh, instead I ended up going, um, I stayed in new London cause these guys are like, you mm -hmm. want to be on this submarine cause it's going to come out of the shipyard and it's going to do some cool stuff. So, uh, I end up getting on that boat and going to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And I, I checked in, like, you know how it is when you, hey, you have a uh, 10 days to report to mm -hmm. duty, right? So you go get your shit and you can, you shouldn't be there in 10 days. You can be there in four days. You'd be there in, anyways, I, uh, I, I got back to the base and then had the base take me to, I had to like take a train or some shit up to New Hampshire because I was riding the submarine back mm -hmm. to Connecticut, right? So I was going to be there when we took it out of the shipyards and everything. And uh, that's when you're doing all the angles and dangles. And the, that's where you do some fun uh, tricking a ship out to figure out if it's capable of, you know, going on test deployments without making transients and stuff after a bunch of repairs. And for us, I walk into the barracks that I'm at in uh, New Hampshire and I see a guy walking towards me and it looks like he's in an Air Force uniform, but he has one of those uh, blue pizza hats, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like this, the skinny ones. Mm -hmm. And it has uh, a butter bar on it, right? So, you know, you know how that works when you're enlisted like mm -hmm. us, we walk by and you're like, hey, what's up? And the guy stops me and I'm trying to pay attention to what he's telling me while trying to understand these ribbons on his mm -hmm. uniform and all this shit. And, uh, you know, he, he hit me up, you know, he hates me a little bit. It was like, what are you doing? Like, you know, that type of shit. And, I was like, this is where it begins, you know? So I'm, I get to the submarine the next day mm -hmm. 
and he's in a Navy uniform and he's an E5. He's he two chevrons. And I was like, wait a second, <laughs> what? And the literal, and he's like, well, I'm Civil Air Patrol. When I'm in a Civil oh, Air geez. Patrol, that's a different outfit and you have to salute me differently. But when I'm in this one, I'm just one of you guys. And I was like, what's oh, wow. the Civil Air Patrol? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like looking around, I'm like, are you, are you people fucking with me right now? <laughs> <laughs> I never even heard of this that's thing hilarious. with you. But I didn't know that you could walk around with, I mean, yeah. that's what he did. He walked around the base all the time in his Civil Air Patrol <laughs> uniform. I don't know. I, I was like, does that like do CB radio talking? Like, I didn't even know <laughs> yeah, what it was. is their role? It's the Civil Air Patrol. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but they They're have still around today. They have butter bars and stuff. Yeah, that guy I'm sure was. He didn't. He didn't stick on the submarine very long. I'm pretty sure he was probably on Jerry Springer probably within the next year or two. But yeah, you get some interesting. You get a lot of guys that are really smart on submarines. So you get a lot of weird. The Civil Air was, Patrol is part of the reserves, I think, <laughs> of the army. <laughs> what was like the first? Your first ride in a submarine, like, like I remember my first jump. Yeah, and I, I just can't imagine. I mean, I'm, su you know, I'm super fascinated about sub world and stuff. And I'm just, do you remember like the first time you like closed hatches and like 100%. went underwater and you're like, holy fuck, I'm really Scary. in a real submarine. Well, it's worse than that. Yeah. The first time that I went to sea was the first time that submarine went back to sea after like four years. Oh wow! And a lot of the officers that we had on the ship had to go ride to other ships to go get their warfare pin and get their certifications as officer of the deck, oh, and yeah. diving officer of the watch and senior watch stations that they had to do because because some guys got to the submarine, they spent two years in, in, mm -hmm. ship, in, in, in shore duty oh, in wow. the shipyard, yeah. you know, managing the repair of the ship. You had all... You had to start inheriting pieces of crew that were there. They, I mean, in the early days, they were just bringing on crew members that were like, it's considered a sea duty, but it's on shore. Yeah. It's on shore right now so that you're not being deployed, but you're getting counted for the sea duty. So you could come mm -hmm. off of that land duty and go right back into another land duty. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always those people that could game the system. So uh, it was scary because I remember none of us on the ship mm -hmm. were really proficient sailors. Oh, yeah. A lot of the people that had been there were the administrators that were getting it in and out of the shipyard. And there were some people that were there the whole time mm -hmm. and some that were, I mean, there were, imagine going to the shipyard and you were on a submarine that was on sea duty, but it was on a shipyard the whole mm -hmm. time. You can't earn your qualifications. You're not getting any deployments. You're not getting anything. It's a horrible place to be. Yeah. I got there right before it left. And I'll tell you, we had a lot of attention to detail when we left because there was a lot of proficiency concerns that mm -hmm. you have when you take a, you know, you, you're gonna try to take your team and you're, and you're gonna try to run them on other crews for proficiency as guests on other ships so they can understand what it's like to stay in the watch. And mm -hmm. cause you don't wanna just take the crew to see for the first time. And, and yeah, there was issues, you know, like, you know, there's a lot of muzzle ball valves on a submarine and people don't realize that what we, it. What's a, what is this? Uh, 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 you have hard flask like, <clears throat> ribbed shells around yeah. a submarine. It's 360 mm -hmm. feet, four inches made a high 80, which is stronger than titanium, less brittle than steel, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it means that we could go down to certain depths and have the submarine compress and, and uh, expand as yeah. necessary, right? Well, you only have, you know, one shaft that sticks out of that submarine that controls the propeller, mm -hmm. right? So you you have to control all these moving pieces and parts on a submarine. Shit, that I never even it, thought about that. Holy cow. Well, it's got, and you know, some of these submarines, not the one I was on, but the, some of them have more weapons on them than if that submarine were to beach itself on any country other mm -hmm. than Russia or America, that country would have the third most powerful weapon arsenal in the world, right? That's wow. how much shit yeah. some of these submarines take to sea with them. Ours is a fast attack boat. Mm -hmm. We do have a reactor on our submarine. So that reactor can, can mm -hmm. draw power and support Chicago. So mm -hmm. we put it on the ship and then we intentionally sink the ship on purpose mm -hmm. so that we can control it because it's like a Coke bottle on the ocean. You know, it's very hard to manage that rock and roll. It's the worst place to be is the submariners on the surface, mm -hmm. right? When you're under underwater, you have fair water planes, dihedrals, mm -hmm. you, you stern planes if you're on a boat that has that. And you have a lot of capacity to to manage the ballast of the ship. Mm -hmm. And the ship has these hull tanks that are these ribbed hard tanks that are designed to withstand ultimate sea pressures where we run at. But we open up muzzle ball valves on the bottom of the ship and open up vent tanks on the mm -hmm. top and we ingest in water into those tanks. And then when they, they are full, we close them both, mm -hmm. but that's enough for us to go out. If we need to change the buoyancy of our ship, <coughs> we'll use compressed air to, mm -hmm. we'll open up those ball valves, use compressed air, vent out mm -hmm. some water, making us more buoyant. And like the first time we were at sea, we were doing sea trials. So we were doing angles and dangles. And we mm -hmm. were like, I remember driving the submarine through an emergency blow, right? Sitting at the helm. And uh, 
if you've never seen like the hunt for October, but it shows mm -hmm. like a submarine jumping out of the water. What you're doing is you're running at a flank bell. Mm -hmm. And then you have the chief of the watch, which will hit what's called the chicken switches, which the chief of the watch sits at what's called uh, the ballast control panel, mm -hmm. the BCP. And he sits there and and he works for the diving officer of the watch, which is controlling the, the helmsman, the planesman. Mm -hmm. And then they're all working for the officer of the deck who's standing next to a fire control technician, a mm -hmm. master of the watch, sonar techs. You have your entire crew in the command role, but it doesn't take a lot of people to drive a ship. But yeah, I mean, you're going as fast as you can. And then you have the, you have the, the chief of the watch throw the chicken switches, mm -hmm. which puts the submarine on the roof. So it's just like this emergency blow, all that compressed air that we have mm -hmm. blows all that water out of the submarine at once. Mm -hmm. So we get massively light. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're on the periscope, we have a couple of periscopes and we're, mm -hmm. you know, when you, when you go up, I remember going on the back end of the periscope and then spinning around and looking at the back of the boat and I could see the propeller spinning in the air. Yeah, oh, it was wow. pretty cool. Because like, we were going right back down. Because once you go uh, up, oh, yeah. we'll sink right back down to like two, three hundred feet. Yeah. Because there's so much momentum. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I mean, it was awesome. I loved it. I mean, they would tie a string to one side of the ship to the other. And then yeah. when we go down to Tep Step, you know, you'd see that string bow quite a bit. You oh, know, because you, of the compression. Oh yeah. Oh, that's so crazy. Yeah. And we'd be at angles sometimes that you could be standing on your tippy toes, uh -huh. leaning forward, and you're you'd be like this far, your face would be this far from the floor because you'd be oh, at such an incredible angle. Wow. Do you know what the, the deepest- That's was? crazy. <laughs> Do you know what the deepest was that you ever went? 100%. What was it? Can't talk about it, right? That's Those are the things that you can't talk about. You can't can you talk about- Can you tell me later? <laughs> <laughs> Scout's honor. But you, those are things where if you look at the book of Jane's, I think it talks about all the submarines depths. And you know, I think that's published around a thousand feet probably. Um, it, that tells you how fast every submarine, here's something unique. It used to be like this. Every submarine has its own unique signature, mm -hmm. which is why we stopped hanging our whole numbers off the side of the submarine. Like you could look at a carrier and see CV 49 yeah. or whatever, but you're not going to see stuff on subs because do you guys remember a few years ago when Trump was president? In fact, there was a bunch of people that said he was too close with Russia because there's this Russian trawler that's sitting off the coast mm -hmm. of the Narragansett Bay operating areas off, yeah. off New York. And that was a fishing trawler that was pulling total rays underneath it. And those are just microphones that are picking up the signatures of every propeller and they could identify there's a ship. So, so they're going to race as close as they can and parallel it. So they could try to catch the signature, the audio signature, because every propeller is different. They each have a yeah. vortex dissipator, which is meant to, uh, when you jump, you have a 55,000 braking horsepower engine. Mm -hmm when you are putting, when you're opening the throttles on a submarine, which means you could torque the submarine so hard that you'll actually turn the, the, the submarine itself could rotate. You have that much braking horsepower on a, on a, if you don't, if you open up the throttles too fast, you'll rotate the ship. The propeller will bite too much into the water and it'll rotate oh, the wrong wow. way, you understand? Really? So that's how much power is on that thing. And, um, and each one of them has this other component to it that makes it to where when you do jump on the stick like that, you typically cavitate. And this would be something that would reduce the cavitation, right? And um, so every submarine, because of this, has its own unique signature. And every submarine has its own purpose, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's fast attack and there's ballistic missile or blah, 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 blah. But um, yeah, I mean, each one kind of goes out and does its own. They, some of them will go to a battle group and they'll be yeah. assigned to battle groups and that's it. And some of them are like, whenever you see an aircraft carrier, just pretend like there's a couple of submarines doing donuts underneath yeah, them. Right. You know, I mean, we're not letting carriers mm -hmm. be out there without submarines and those things. But there's some of the submarines that are out, you know, the Northern Ice Pack, mm -hmm. you know, enforcing uh, certain things that take place up there. You do counter drug addictions mm -hmm. in the South Caribbean, you're in the med, you're going through into the Suez and then going through the Persian, right? So there's- Just going under ships and they don't even know you're there. Yeah. And and the Southern Art Techs are, they're so trained. Mm -hmm. Like I remember one time standing in the control room and one of the Southern Art Techs was a friend and, and we were trying to go into the, I think we were going into the Straits of Gibraltar submerged, but we were trying to go underneath a big merchant ship so it can mask mm -hmm. our noise. And uh, one of the sonar techs uh, was real smart. And I asked him, I said, hey, cause you could almost feel it on the boat, you know, like you could almost hear it on the boat uh, cause we were that close. Mm. And I remember I said, uh, how fast do you think that ship's going above us? And I remember he put his hand on the hole and he's like, that's a seven bladed screw. It's making four to seven turns. It's going 12 knots. 
you know, I mean, I don't remember what the exact numbers were, but- Yeah, but he could feel the vibration. Everybody on that ship is a subject matter expert at something, right? So if that's your job, like that's the one thing I loved about being on the submarine. Even the cooks knew how to freaking control the ship to make sure that we weren't going to sink. They knew how to operate, you know, things that had to happen. And I just, I liked being in the submarine community because I felt like the standard to be there was higher yeah. than just being physically fit. You had to have some sort of, you well, first of all, you're like a triple volunteer, mm -hmm. you know, like- you volunteered for the Navy, then you volunteered to be in the summer community, then you volunteered to be in fast attack community. So by then you kind of, you knew what you were getting into. It's Fridays and Saturdays too. You're gone all the uh -huh. time. And and if you're a married person or if you miss your high school sweetheart, that's not a place where you wanted to be, right? But I loved, I did not join the Navy to stay at home, right? So I loved it, right? And I got to do some awesome things. I did, uh, I did, submarines have a couple different really they do vertical launching, right? So they could be uh, launch Madcap Mark 48s. They mm -hmm. could launch torpedoes, tomahawks. Um, they can do anti-submarine hunting, right? Yeah. So submarine and submarine hunting. They can deploy the SF. Mm -hmm. They can sit off the coast of third world countries with um, arrays in the air and pick up comms in places that no one knows that they're at. I mean, there's so many versatile applications yeah. to what a submarine can do. And those are just fast attack, right? Then you have other submarines. And I mean, submarines submarines made the difference in the Cold War, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't our infantry, all joking aside, right? I yeah. mean, the nuclear deterrence, there's, think about attrition, strength through attrition. I know we're wrapping this one up, but if there's a, uh, I always tell people, I go, this is, maybe we'll wrap it up with some statistics, mm -hmm. right? We always say, you see 1%, you know, um, stickers on people's trucks and stuff. And mm -hmm. the one percenters are typically the 1%, it's known that 1% of the population has joined the military, but they actually it's less than one half of 1% of the mm -hmm. US population has joined the military. So follow me around the horn into the Navy from uh -huh. So take our, our US population, one last of one half of 1% of the US population is in uniform. Now of that 85% of that one half of 1% is enlisted, right? You two are officers, mm -hmm. we were enlisted. 15% were officers, right? So that's a very, very small number. But let's just say the Navy is 300,000 people, right? So 300,000 people, uh, how many warships? Let's just say there's 300 mm -hmm. warships. Of those, there's say 75 submarines. And of those, 55 of those are the nuclear deterrent. Or they represent 55% of the nuclear deterrent. Mm -hmm. And that means you went from that populace to, if you only have 300 warships, if you're in the Navy and you're a captain yeah. of a warship, you're the tip of the spear. That's the tip of the spear. I mean, even the infantry has got to get there somehow, right? So you still need, you still need, um, it's amazing how how few do, do so much for so many yeah. and 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 don't even know about mm -hmm. it, right? And those, those statistics I just rattled off, I hope would be eye-opening to certain people mm -hmm. because some people just, they look at the military like they look at cancer. And what I mean by that is like, do you know anybody that's been a drug addict? Do you know anybody that's had cancer? Mm -hmm. Of course you have. Do you know anybody that's been in the military? Yeah, we know somebody. I had an aunt or a cousin or my grandparents or some shit, but like, how about 60% of all small businesses after World War II were owned by veterans? Now yeah. it's less than 4%, right? So we add a lot, we contribute a lot, yeah. significance to what happens, but we, uh, we're just not being disruptive enough, which mm -hmm. is why I think, um, we have to continue to build these companies and build these platforms that can make a difference, yeah, right? right? So, agreed. and that's the purpose of this po of this podcast and this veteran one, which I love with the many directions that it took, uh -huh. you know, where we were just kind of bouncing around and got a little bit funny, a little bit serious, a little bit funny, a little serious, but that's us. That's the military mindset too. I mean, hurry up and wait. And I could tell you this, uh, I would be getting out of my rack and racing down a hallway before I even was awake because my muscle memory, because we would be doing oh, a fire sure. drill and I'd be the nozzle team of a fast team, what? And and I remember just learning all kinds of things that I was capable of doing without even thinking about doing them, you know? And I mm -hmm. think that those are scenarios, like how can, my, I have a son who's a sophomore in college and mm -hmm. one who's a freshman in college. They're awesome. They're at a really young age where they're learning a lot of cool things, but how can you compete with young soldiers, sailors and airmen that are doing the things that we were doing at that young age, or I'm not saying don't go to college, but I'm like, college ain't what it used to be, right? And I'm not for it, I'm not against it. I think that there's a journey that exists in the middle. Right now, I have two kids in college. My daughter and I, who she's like, 
She's like, only gonna apply to SEC schools, but she's talking to me about military intelligence. And I'm like, listen, if you could go that route, mm -hmm. uh, you'll be exposed to a lot of incredible things. And then you could come out and you could get into sales, you get into leadership, you get in a lot of different things. It's very versatile if you get into intelligence, wouldn't you agree? Mm -hmm. The versatility that comes from that background allows you to evolve into a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I got a funny story for you about that. So my son, right, he's an MI officer. He transitioned from field artillery to MI, and he was at Huachuca in, in the transition course. Um, he called me one day and he's like, Hey, like these dudes came into class one day and pulled me out of class to like talk to me about like like what I was doing. Because they were his, his last name. Yeah. And he's like, What do you have any idea why? And so that was when I had to like Let explain to him like what I did and stuff. Yeah. Listen, that's awesome. I mean, my dad's older. He flew B fifty twos. He turned yeah. turned eighteen in Vietnam, loading bombs on F fours, came yeah. out twenty four years later as a uh, Lieutenant Colonel yeah. and flew a lot of things, and he has crazy stories too. Even from his time, you know, oh, lots of missions and thirty hour missions because oh, yeah. they're getting KC one thirty fives, refueling them all the way through. They'll fly for thirty straight hours. That's nuts. Imagine taking off from my not going yeah. to bombing Gaddafi, flying right back home for dinner. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Again, Hamas. <laughs> <laughs> listen to these stories. <laughs> So listen, let's uh, bring it home. I appreciate you guys making the time. This is going to come out on Veterans Day, right? So yep. this is really targeted for those that want to leave the military and aren't sure what the jobs are that are out there. Come find us. Mm -hmm. yeah. The name is Overwatch. Yeah, right on. Reach out to any of these guys on the on their LinkedIn and, and uh, we'll respond, right? Because we want to add to this collection of misfit toys that we keep building. Uncommon people. Very Thanks good. for being here, guys. Yep, appreciate thanks. It. thanks. Appreciate guys. it. Later.